Good evening, everybody. Great to see you. So glad you decided to come worship and study with us. Um, I'm excited. This is going to serve, just to clarify for some of you, this is going to serve as a, an intro. We're actually going to start next week doing, trying, attempting to do an overview of a book of the Bible each Wednesday. Now that's very, very difficult because these are, some of these are, you know, chapters long. I'm starting in Genesis, and for a person who struggles with speaking too quickly, uh, it's going to be, it's going to be quite the challenge. I even thought about giving, uh, <laughs> let you have hand signals to kind of slow down or do this sort of thing like you're an air traffic controller to help me uh, keep track of what I'm doing tonight. But um, I wanted to intro with what uh, I consider to be, a, uh, and many consider to be, a very, very important, um, not only reminder, but um, a foundation. Um, there are a lot of people in our culture today that would think it is a massive waste of time for you to go do anything with regard to the Bible on a weekly basis. Uh, they would also go on to say that if you're doing anything, even some Christians would say, well, why are you even talking about the Old Testament? Um, isn't the New Testament more important? So we're going to get to that, but let me go to our key text first and foremost and read it together. Um, the name of this intro is called God Breathed. God Breathed. And this is the text. You should be able to follow it on the screen here. 2 Timothy 3, 12 through 17. We'll pray after and then I'll repeat it slowly. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted while evildoers and impostors will go from being bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue on what you've learned and become convinced of because you know those from whom you learned it. And from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. All Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. This is God's word. Would you bow with me? Holy Spirit, we ask your presence here. Earlier in this very book, you admonish us through the millennia when we open this book up to correctly handle the truth. So we ask for you to come meet us, speak to us through your word. We lay ourselves before your word, do with it and with us as you will. And all God's people said, amen. Now I'm gonna go back and I'm going to repeat and stop at a couple of points because almost every line of this passage out of St. Paul's incredible instruction manual for leadership in the early church, given you see in First and Second Timothy and Titus, almost every line the culture says no. Christians might say no. Let's do it really slowly. Verse 12, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Whoa, 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 wait a second, wait a second. I thought a godly life meant unending blessing. What is he talking about here? I, it's not what I signed on for. While evildoers and imposters, whoa, 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 what are you calling names for? Evil to whom? Imposter in which case? We'll go from bad to worse, says who? Deceiving and being deceived? Well, isn't a lie context sensitive? But as for you, continue in what you've learned. Wait, wait, I need to continue what I've learned? Continue, I can stop moving on in discipleship and holiness and sanctification. Continue what you've learned and become convinced of because you know those from whom you learned it. There was someone that taught you that is attempting to live it and has shown you the way and lived it as well as taught it. And how from infancy you've known the Holy Scriptures. Oh, indoctrination. Parents teaching their kids the Bible, Bible drills, royal rangers, in our particular context, Bible quiz. You've known the scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Well, I don't know if this makes you wise, does it? Would the culture say this makes you wise? If 
finally, all scriptures God breathed and useful for teaching. Well, I think I got everything I need. Thanks anyway, going to heaven. Rebuking, elegmos is the word. Some versions of the Bible say reproof. Wait a second, the word of God is supposed to correct me, even rebuke me? Does that ever happen? How do I know when it does happen? Correcting, training, what do you mean training in righteousness? Isn't that just being pharisaical, holier than thou? What does training look like? And thoroughly equipped for every good work, good according to whom? Good according to any good work, according to whom? How? I'm gonna teach you a couple phrases tonight as memory hooks to help you. And I think, I think it'll be a blessing to you, but if, if there's issue with this, there's going to be issue all along our journey through the entire Bible. You guys remember years ago, one of the most requested series from Pastor Betzer was Route 66. Route 66, 66 books of the Bible. It took him two and a half years to go through that. And when he introed that series, or talked about what was coming, he said, you gotta be convinced it's worth your time, or you're not gonna put the effort in. And there were some in the congregation back in around 2011, 2012, that said these very things to him. What do we mean by, why do we have to go over it? We got it. We got it. We got God's word, right? Basically, you're preaching to the choir. And he went to this text with a couple of them. He went to this very text and said, I'm just doing what the word says for a good, for a good leader or teacher to do, amen? So, <clears throat> God breathed is a really unique Greek word. Theonos, theonotsos, theonotsos. It's a very, very unique word. And, it, and it's one of the ways you know Paul was serious about the fact that what he was referring to as the word of God would likely have been what? The Old Testament at the time when he's talking to Timothy here. But theonustas, theonustas is God breathed. And I actually wanted to tell you guys that because I think it's actually a prettier word than the God breathed hyphenated word there, theonustas. Theonustas is, is the word there that Paul uses to say all scripture is God breathed. A lot of the New Testament authors would also put that in that category as well. The Bible is, and I will say this up here, and I hope you felt this all the way through your time at First Assembly. The Bible is by nature the sole authority for the church, and scripture, scripture is special. So we're going to talk about how easy it is to come out from under the authority of the Word. Everything in the culture is directed at taking this away from you. I'm gonna give you two examples. This has been a fight that comes around even between Christians every couple of decades. It's a fight to say the word matters. We're not educated enough, mature enough to move past God's word, amen? That's what tonight's about. How we can be warned and stay true to God's word in a culture that aims every one of their ideas at downgrading this sort of thing, right? So the whole idea of, actually, you know what? <laughs> we'll say it together. I'll split it up into four. Repeat after me. They, on, u, stas. They, on, u, stas. God breathed. Let it be known in this church Amongst this leadership and amongst Theonustas is where we are at. God's word is supreme. It is the sole authority for the church, for the church. You guys know that when the, the first, one of the first bigger arguments about the authority of scripture over and above tradition was, you guys know Martin Luther? Early 1500s, 1519s, Reformation. Out of that came five solas, right? Alone, sola is Latin for alone. We're gonna be talking about sola scriptura, scripture alone today. There's also sola gratia, grace alone, sola feed, faith alone, sola deo gloria to the glory of God and solus Christus, Christ alone and God's glory alone. We're gonna talk about sola scriptura tonight and go, I'm just gonna make, it's, it's uncomfortable. Most Christians I meet aren't sola people. They're not sola scriptura people. And I'll show you why, but let's look at two historic examples really quickly. When Luther was at his trial in the 1500s, he had all of his works on a table. Pope Leo X was not there. 
Pope Leo's staff was there, predominantly led by his cardinal, Cardinal Cayetan. And the words you did not want to hear in 1500, or even that 250 year period around 1500, 1590, you did not want to hear this. Do you recant? Do you recant? And that's exactly what Luther heard at this trial called the Diet of Worms. Worms was a city in Germany. And at this trial, he was being put on trial for him saying, I don't believe church tradition and the church hierarchy is to be put over and above scripture. And for this, for this, he was excommunicated. This is where we get the whole idea of a protest movement called Protestantism, Protestantism. I want you to listen to his words at the trial. By the way, his answer is the reason why you and I have a, have a scripture to look at today and can do a study like this in a place like this today. Listen to what he said. You probably remember some of these words. Do you recant for these works that are challenging the Pope, the church, the hierarchy? Unless I can be instructed and convinced from evidence in the Holy Scriptures, my conscience is captive to the Word of God, Theanustas. Here I stand, I can do no other. He literally banked his life on God's Word. Banked his life on God's Word. Now, he ended up being protected and getting out of that situation, but just 300 years later, you have another person in a whole other context also having a fight like this. This gentleman with this beautiful beard is sometimes called the Prince of Preachers. This is Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Charles Haddon Spurgeon was a preacher in London who became media. <laughs> like a meteorite. He became spectacularly popular very quickly and it actually hurt his ministry. And during the latter part of his, his preaching ministry, he gave, became embroiled in a controversy where he felt like a lot of his friends in the Baptist Union that also preached through London, who weren't near as popular or attacked by the media, were downgrading God's word. God's word was to be put lower than some of the cultural ideas at the time. And it bothered him because he had paid a pretty hefty price to stick true to God's word. Charles Haddon C.H. Spurgeon, uh, Spurgeon. Spurgeon put his indictment in a, in a, a magazine called The Sword and the Trowel and named names. Some are friends, some are acquaintances. I have the transcripts, because they started publishing transcripts of sermons. This, 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 this. And he said they were capitulating to something that had come out of Germany 300 years after, 250, 300 years after the Reformation, which was German higher criticism that tried to say the Bible's, we've moved past it. Bible's kind of old school, you know, we gotta modernize. By the way, every single movement away from tradition and orthodoxy has as its purpose to make the Bible more palatable to people. Everyone, from, from, from Arius, even Athanasius back in the day, an early church father, he was contramundum against the world. But listen to what Spurgeon said when he operated at, like a prophet. This is his most prophetic statement as he was getting attacked. By the way, his wife, Susanna, said this is what probably put him in an early grave. He had gout, he struggled with gout, he struggled with his health issues all of his life. But Susanna, his wife, said this probably put him in his grave because he broke the 11th commandment. You don't speak ill of another Baptist. Listen. <laughs> listen to this. I want to get this right. For the next 50 years, I'm quite willing to be eaten by dogs dogs that were his friends in ministry. But the more distant future shall vindicate me. The more distant future shall vindicate me. If there ever was an age where downgrades an understatement for how we view the Bible culturally, or how the churches treat the Bible in our, in, in, in our context, the Christian context, it would be now. Listen to this. This is right out of the sword and the trowel. Inspiration and speculation cannot long abide in peace. Compromise compromise, there can be none. We cannot hold the inspiration of the word and reject it at the same time. We cannot believe in the atonement and deny it. We cannot talk the doctrine of the fall and yet talk of the evolution of the spiritual life from human nature. One way or another, we must go. Decision is the virtue of the hour. Where are you going to go? With the word or with speculation? With the word or with the culture? Every, every era has this fight. What are you going to do with God's word? Are you, sol are you a sola person, sola scriptura, along with the other solas? Or 
are you a different sola? The Roman Catholic Church, uh, our, our brothers and sisters in the Roman Catholic Church, um, they do not believe in sola scriptura. That, they responded to this in 1546 and said it's the church tradition and the word, and the word, and thereby cut themselves off from Reformation. Because it really boils down to if you're going to reject sola scriptura or the authority of scripture, you're going to eventually put something else over it. You can't share the top spot. And so sola ecclesia was their claim, the church and the tradition of the church. And then when you started asking, well, which tradition, which church father, which pope, which books, Uh, right? And this has led all the way down to where we're at now as, as Christians in this context with Roman Catholic brothers and sisters that have to deal with somebody like Francis. I said it. So that's where we're at right now. If you look at these two words, they're, again, they're from the Greek. Antinomian means lawless, right? Anti, nomos. Nomos is Greek for law. The other word you're probably familiar with too, anarchy, comes from the Greek as well. On, the negative, arkos, right? Arkos, leaderless. We're in a culture that has made a sport out of rebellion. Any leader suspect, by the way, that was an inheritance from my generation, Question everything, absolute fool, but that's, that's gone downstream. Most Christians you meet probably aren't sola scriptura. We're gonna talk about that uh, tonight. Um, by the way, the Roman Catholic objection from Luther all the way to today is this. If you let people interpret the Bible on their own, you're just gonna continue to mess up with no guardrails until you become TBN. That's it, that's the end point. Um, so, that's the, that's, that's the first idea going on there. So with the Roman Catholics, it's sola ecclesia. It boils down to the church alone. They say it's sharing. There's the three stools, the magisterium, the leaders, right? The church tradition, and then what? The word of God. But at the end of the day, it boils down to sola ecclesia. What about our broader culture? That adfectus is Latin for feelings or emotions. It is sola adfectus in our culture, isn't it? Your feelings alone, your emotions alone. That is the thing. Some high-end scholars call it expressive individualism, but it's the same thing. It's being an authority as unto yourself. So I'm gonna make a rather startling claim here in a moment, and here's the startling claim. There are many different ways to cash out the problems going on right now in Christianity, right? Many, many different ways. But we wanna avoid what's called drift. Did you know in Hebrews 2, 1, it talks about pay close attention to what's coming next or else you might drift, pereo, you might drift away from these things. If you look around, why, what do you tell your friends why the church is cratering? What do you tell them? There's a lot of different causes for the decline. I'm gonna make an audacious claim tonight in front of you and it's this. I think it's, the end is already determined if you downgrade scripture. You're already heading for the wrong, in the wrong direction. Mainline churches are cratering, college universities. Let me just tell you this. One of the things I pray about not getting despondent about is the fact that many, many mainline seminaries and universities will not hire you if you say, I believe the word's inerrant or infallible. I think the word, even if you say, I think the Bible's authoritative and you drill down a bit to say, it can change my trajectory. I allow it to change, to rebuke, to correct and train me. No thanks. No thank you. You see this in churches, you see it in universities, you see it in seminaries. Let me give you one of the professors, one of the guys I admire most in the world right now. He is brilliant, genius level intellect, encyclopedic memory, in New Testament studies, N.T. Wright, N.T. Wright is the man. He did a trilogy years ago that was, I used in my doctoral dissertation. You gotta be on the side of N.T. Wright if you're doing any sort of significant work. He did a trilogy called the, uh, uh, the New Testament and the People of God, Jesus and the Victory of God, and the Resurrection of the Son of God, and it is astounding. It is probably one of his longest works, incredible. You wanna be on the right side, scholarship? Here's a guy who's largely faithful. But when it comes to social issues, NT, NT does not, he doesn't think the Bible needs to apply to these sort of things. Very, very soft on social issues. He doesn't think you should apply the Bible one-to-one in these sort of situations or even attempt to do it. In fact, 
He's been quoted as calling this, the idea of an infallible or an errant Bible, though he treats it authoritatively, slices it real thin there, that silly American doctrine, and will not accept correction from any of his other people that are equally bright, that actually have a conviction of the authority of the word. So in that sense, N.T. Wright can be N.T. wrong, but he is, he is, he, he is a large, he is a champion for us, but he is in a tradition, the Anglican tradition, Episcopalian in America, Anglican in Europe. He's in an Anglican tradition that has long since said goodbye to the authority of the word. Long since said goodbye to it. I had a professor a couple of years ago say um, <laughs> that this is one of the best things to come out of the Anglican tradition was the Book of Common Prayer. Um, but Bishop Wright is largely someone you can trust in these sort of things, but then he has this very, very, very nuanced view <laughs> of the authority of the Word of God. Let me go a step further. Now, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna do, I'm not going to do a trick on you, but I'm doing something I shouldn't do, and that's you don't pop open issues as a leader in any sort of context, any audience context, but especially a teaching context that you're not going to close the lid on. Well, I'm popping them open, and if you want, if you're interested, there are answers, and there are answers in abundance. But I'm gonna go over things that probably won't apply to anybody in this room because you're here on a Wednesday night. But it might apply to your grandchildren or your children. And it's this, the all out assault on God's word. Bart Ehrman is the professor of comparative religions at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Bart Ehrman is an incredibly scholarly, brilliant, interactive, funny professor. Of all the professors that have their lectures on Amazon, he is the most downloaded and listened to. And he is the best known critic of our Bible in the English speaking world. People can't get enough of him. Extraordinarily popular, extraordinarily popular. Now when he's debated on the scriptures and whether they're worthy of our attention and trust and affection and and connection, he usually gets beaten up pretty bad. He usually gets beaten up by people that are faithful to God's word and actually know what he knows. In fact, I call him the P.T. Barnum of atheism. He takes these facts and puts them up and and it expands them out so no one can trust this sort of thing. And then we ask a couple of clarifying questions like, well, but very funny, very interactive. He's gone on record and said he's got the best critics. He was a moody Bible guy, Princeton Seminary, under the best, one of the brightest Greek Jedi of the New Testament in the 20th century named Bruce Metzger and literally flipped, flipped at Princeton. Now he goes on and says things all the time. Basically, his books can be divided into three categories. And these are the three categories that most universities hammer your kids with. First is this, the Bible's origins. How do we know who wrote these? When did they write it? Who picked them? Who knows? There are answers for that, but that's the first way they go at university setting, right? Next is the Bible's transmission. Well, even if it were the eyewitnesses' words, how do we know we have them? Didn't it go through a bunch of translations? And gosh, I did German and Latin and Greek and English and Coptic, right? So the Bible's transmission is the next area of diluting or cracking or crevicing somebody's faith, especially when they come out of a Christian community and they're now in a high, high temptation community. Bible's content, the Bible's content. This can be divided into about four categories. Here's it, here they are in short order. First one, some believe that if they've actually read the Bible, it contradicts itself all over the place. This is, uh, this is the assumption, ground level assumption at university in most seminaries today. Two, they think it errs in matter of fact. Now this is even harder to sustain because the Bible has an, an incredible historic pedigree. Third, it says those miracles are pesky. Don't we live in a technological age? Who can believe that stuff, right? Swallowed by a whale, split in the Red Sea. And last but not least, the idea that the Bible just has immoral things in it that I don't like talking about. Any sort of keyword or catchword. Is it discussing slavery here? Did Jesus really call people dogs? What, I mean, what about the Yahweh Wars in the Old Testament? So that's, those are the three ways the Bible is attacked at university. Now look, we're not talking about that tonight because I don't think any of you are in that category. But if your kids are, there are answers out there, one, or grandkids, Here's two, you know what they need? They need a good mentor with a lot of good information and a lot of prayer that becomes their smaller community since they've left this community. There's the prescription. There are answers out there. Airman, like I said, Airman has had to admit a number of things that he doesn't have to admit when he has the microphone and the lectern in the classroom. But that isn't where we're at, right? That may be somebody you know, but that's not where we're at. So forgive me, we could spend the next four weeks going over each one of these and going this is why 
the way Ehrman presents it, it's not the way it should be presented. So what about a church? Can a church slide in their theanostas, their God-breathed commitment? Yes. This woman here is a, is a Christian, and a, I would say an acquaintance, I wouldn't call her a friend, Elisa Childers, who was part of a Christian, um, contemporary Christian uh, pop group. <laughs> You're already on your way to, <laughs> anyway. Anyway, so she, was, she, she had a crisis of faith, left the church, what a shock. Anyway, and Elisa came back to a church that she thought was a faithful, Bible, Bible trustworthy church, a Bible honoring church, and was immediately asked to be in leadership, because you used to be a kind of a celebrity, Elisa wrote a bestseller called Another Gospel about her journey back to a God-honoring, Christ-honoring church and leaving the one she returned to after her crisis of faith, being part of a group called Zoe Girl. She summarized this and done it in different, put it out in podcasts, put it out in audio, put it out in blogs, put it out in the book. The book was a bestseller. It's well worth your time. She said, five ways you can tell your church might be sliding. Might be sliding, right? I'm not going to give you all five, but let me give you three. Here's number one, a lowered view of the Bible. Oh, the Bible's okay, right? A couple of weeks ago, I had a, a gentleman call that had been, he wanted to tell me he'd been to our church six times, six times. I was like, that's awesome. And when I probed him about why he left the other church that remain unnamed, he said, well, they're trying to draw people and that's laudable, right? But it's, listen, his words, it's a TED talk with a half a scripture sprinkled on top. So for us, it was, oh, Pastor Russ is, I mean, it's just, you know, I counted seven, we're averaging seven or nine, seven to nine in his six. Um, lowered view of the Bible. Let me give you number two. Her second thing said this, feelings are emphasized over facts. That doesn't make me feel good. So let's get rid of that scripture, right? Whether it's facts in general revelation or facts presented in the Bible about the spiritual life. And three out of five, general essential doctrines are reinterpreted, retooled, especially when it comes to hell and sexuality. Always retooled, readjusted. So, one of my favorite scholars of all time is a guy that's in his, I think he's about turn 80. Uh, His name's Don Carson. he was a Dallas Theological graduate. Dallas Theolo- Theological Seminary is still probably one of the best known seminaries out there. He was trained to believe that we're kind of off because we're Pentecostals. He was trained to be a cessationist, that the Holy Spirit doesn't work in that pesky way that Paul describes in Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians th- uh, uh, 12 as well. Yeah, that, that, that was for the disciples, right? Well, he's no longer a cessationist. He's like, you can't be, put yourself under the word and say those things must have stopped for the disciples. It doesn't look like that at all. What else has stopped? Right, if Paul's saying he's giving instructions to an errant Corinthian community. So he's not a cessationist anymore, but he's also a churchman. Isn't that great? He's a high-end scholar that stayed a preacher at a church. Trinity Evangelical Seminary is where he teaches in Chicago. And he did something years ago that became one of the most viewed things by seminarians and, and church planters online for many, many, many years. And it was over a decade ago. And it's this, it's the title, Subtle Ways to Abandon the Authority of Scripture. He's like, we're not talking about the people that are under the spell of airmen that have left their Christian community. We're talking about people in the pews. People in the pews. Subtle ways to abandon the authority of Scripture. He gave 10 of them. Childers came behind him and said, look, um, let's make it even more simple. Ways you can leave the Bible being important to you without even knowing it. So I want you to put yourself in these shoes and think, have I done this? Has my family done this tonight? And I'm gonna offer a corrective as well. Here's the first one. You only focus on the parts of the Bible that appeal to you. You ever wonder where the health and wealth gospel came from? It's not hard. Pastor Russ will tell you. Anybody will tell you. Dr. Earl will tell you. You take blessing passages, provision passages, and you're a child of the king passages, and all of a sudden, (laughs) God owes you a pretty nice life. So you focus on things that appeal to you. And that can happen in your own devotional life. It can happen, it, it can happen to any of us. So is that something that can slowly, almost imperceptibly erode your sola position or your theonostas position? The corrective, read, then hear preaching and teaching from all over the Bible, especially what we call the balancing verses. See that you're trying in your devotional life and in your church life 
that you're trying to look all over the word for ways to make things more clear, clarify things, bring them to, to your attention. Number two, you're embarrassed about certain parts of the Bible. We mentioned this earlier. Um, there are certain parts of the Bible that are very difficult to understand and, and even more difficult to apply. If you're embarrassed about them, you're probably going to avoid them. And therefore, whatever God wants to speak to you through that theanostas is that God-breathed text is going to be lost. So trying to understand how to, what, gain a deeper understanding of God's word and seek quality teaching on it, on these issues. Don't run from it. Seek it. Try to understand. By the way, I'm going to give you, if anybody, you can just email me if you want the PowerPoint. I want you to just lock, hey, lock in. I'll, I'll, I'll get you. I'll hook you up when you just, just email me. Um, number three, you open yourself up to reinterpret essential doctrines. What's the corrective to that? Learn the difference between essential and non-essential. You practice, this is a big one. You practice ignorance in the name of mystery. Uh, a couple of years ago, um, there was a woman who was considered to be, they called her, you know they used to call Oprah Winfrey, uh, the, the pastor to women in their middle age because she was on at four o'clock and she was a, an unbelievable star, right? And they're like, they'll listen to anything Oprah says and then she gives them a car or something like that. One of the things, the person that followed her was a woman who had a best-selling book, Fierce and Free. Her name was Jen Hatmaker. She was an online influencer, had a best-selling book, and then had two, and a, two million plus followers online. She's no longer a Christian. She has left the faith. But she employed what was called by a very, very faithful minister named Kevin DeYoung, the hat maker hermeneutic. Hermeneutic just means how you pull meaning out of the scripture. How do you pull meaning out of the scripture? And Jen's daughter, Jen's hat maker's daughter, d- declared herself a lesbian. And Jen hat maker said, well, these scriptures are just really hard to understand, so I don't think God has a problem with this lifestyle. In fact, I know it looks like sin, but who can understand these passages? I don't, they're, they're very unclear to me. And that was while she was trying to remain a Christian and then ended up leaving Christianity because it didn't, it didn't go over well. Um, people correctly pointed out that, Jen, I, you may be very popular, but this is, uh, this is something you can do in any part of Scripture. You can say, well, it's really ambiguous. I don't, there, aren't, there are difficult Scriptures and difficult to apply Scriptures. But this looked clearly like her and her husband were being tendentious, right? So you want to have humble Humble in get investigation of ambiguity, not intentional ambiguity, so you can do whatever you want. Amen? That's a subtle way, right? So take notice of your use of biblical ambiguity and check with others, the living and the dead, about what the Christian tradition has said with regard to interpreting these passages and applying them. That way you're not just leaving it up to your own desires and your own fallen perspective. Five, you let your theology inform how you interpret the Bible instead of letting the Bible inform your theology. Have you ever been in a sermon where this happens or a teaching where somebody wants the word to say this and they will find parts of scripture or words that justify it? Studiously ignore other passages that would say, I don't know about that. But you want to let the Bible inform your theology, your logos, theos, your logos, your thought of God, not the other way around. Checking context and frequency of key verses. In other words, you're trying to harmonize things in the Bible. You don't want to just look at cherry picked passages. Remember the guy, what the gentleman said? A TED talk with a half scripture sprinkled over it? Six, you don't read the Bible very often and you focus primarily on contemporary writers and commentators. Read the thing, amen? (laughs) Praise God, if you get anything out of tonight, please read it, please read it. I know reading is now passe, everybody, it's moving pictures, right? Um, The word and the the written word was a great information Uh, uh, delivery and embedding device. But anyway, um, what's the corrective? Read the word, study the word, and look at past paragons, people that have paid the price and stood by their convictions in the word that have done incredible things, clearly by the power of the Holy Spirit. And that way, you can say, okay, I'm not just going to stick with contemporary writers that are a little bit mm, conditioned by the culture and in my same scenario. Okay? So that's a help there. Number seven, you fail to connect the Bible's authority to what the Bible actually teaches. Oh, yeah, I'm all for the Word of God. Absolutely. Yeah, and when it teaches about, like, the Spirit, I believe there's spirits, and, man, there's, you know, there's, there's all sorts of things about, like, uh, you know, you should be good and care about other people. That's awesome. Who, who doesn't? I mean, a lot many people disagree with that more today than, than otherwise, but this has a lot of other things as well, doesn't it? It gives us a lot of stories about other things as well. 
Are you attempting to continue to put yourself under God's word so that he can, it can be the change agent in your life? Return to confession and self-evaluation. This is hard. Everything in the culture says no one tells you what to do. No authority over you. You wake up, you look inside yourself. If there are feelings and emotions, that's your reality. And anybody that says different is trying to control you. Eight, you either focus too much or too little on the intellectual side of the Bible. Big, big problem in my world. I, I actually really like it. It's almost like a hobby going in and learning about these sort of things. It can make you unavailable for doing Holy Spirit ministry. The other side is, well, I don't need any of that stuff. I don't have to think too hard. I've got my B-I-B-L-E, right? Basic instructions before leaving earth and I'm good and me, me and Jesus are great. Bible-based worship and communal accountability. The thing I think Pastor Russ has been banging on since day one. You need the community. This was not made to be done alone, no matter how brilliant you might think you are or how simple you think you are because that shows your humility. <clears throat> Man, 804. All right, I'm not... Um, Last night, uh, okay, you interpret the Bible through a specific modern cultural philosophical lens rather than let the text speak for itself. Last night, I saw an, an enormously popular person because somebody bought me a ticket. I don't normally buy tickets, this sort of thing. I got to see Jordan Peterson at, the, at Hertz Arena. If there was ever someone that nine applies to, ever someone, well, yes, I believe in the resurrection, said Peterson. Doesn't it show the very common human component that your worst day can be the best day for everybody? Well, uh, of course I believe in the, in the, uh, the incarnation, right? That, that Jesus was the archetype, the archetype of all, what all, the model of what every human wants to be. I mean, look at his popularity. Yeah, okay. In other words, you interpret the Bible through a cultural, philosophical lens, and that's shaping what you're doing. This is probably, again, he's one of those guys, his wife, it looks like his wife's a believer, his daughter Michaela's a believer. Every time he's asked to affirm the God existence or Jesus, he's like, this is awesome, but I'm not gonna say that. Isn't there more to this? Of course there's more to it. I got to meet him afterwards. And we got to talk about this sort of, a little bit about this. He took one of the questions on this very subject. And he said, well, isn't the resurrection bigger than just a historic? What does it mean to even say something historical? And the gentleman pointed out, it was actually a guy from France that was Russian, ethnically Russian. And through broken English, he said, the apostle Paul tells us first and foremost, it happened. It was historic first. In other words, we're told how to begin our interpretation before it fans out into all these other wonderful things. What do you do? Know the history of Christianity and the themes of Scripture. Know the history of Christianity and themes in Scripture, and that way you're not caught by just interpreting it with a, a lens that's just, that's just to the culture right now. Of course, you want to be relevant, right? But at the same time, you want to try to let the text speak for itself and not put your ideas over top of it. It looked like that's what was happening. I left that talk at Hertz. We, we, and I thought, no one's going to come to Jesus. They're going to think, man, I really shouldn't have taken the Bible. I should have taken the Bible more seriously. That's a win. But they would not leave and go, I need Jesus to reframe my heart. I need to be saved. They would never walk away with that. By the way, that's, uh, <laughs> we'll talk about it next week in Genesis. We can talk about how his version of Bible analysis is extraordinarily popular today. Extraordinarily popular. Ten, you let things like pride, sin, and doubt keep you from grasping your need for the Bible. We're going to look at a scripture in Isaiah 40 that says, here are the ones God favors. Those that are humble and contrite and do what? Tremble at his word. If you have these sort of, we all have them, pride, sin, and doubt, don't let it keep you from saying, I need the word. You can even go logical. It has revolutionized the lives of billions of people today and the democracy of the dead, billions more revolutionize their lives are they all liars that's very practical pragmatic no no i need this word to condition me i need to sing it i need to study it i need to quote it i need the word to work on me and the holy spirit to work on me in that way humble ourselves confess and repent the things our culture hates most confess repent especially a culture that valorizes the victim 
Um, I think so. I want to give you a modern example of somebody that the word was, at, was a bomb for her. You know I'm, I'm addicted to converts, right? I love a conversion story. This woman was the poster child for everything anti-God. Rosaria Butterfield, sounds like a made-up name. Rosaria, brilliant, lit PhD, L.I. literature, not lit, no, L.I. literature major from Ohio State University. Where's, where's Yanni? Is he here? At, right out, shout out, even though she went the wrong way. Anyway, lesbian, atheist, tenured professor. Openly admitted every student that came into my classroom, we're going to learn a little bit about lit, but really we're going to learn about the worst piece of literature in human history, the Bible. That's what she was going to do with every class that came through. And then go back home to her lesbian girlfriend. She's now been married 20 years, raised four kids to a church planner and missionary. She is someone that there, is, there are algorithms to keep her messages off the internet. So Promise Keepers comes to Columbus and Dr. Butterfield goes, I am writing something in the op-ed column about this horrible group connected to a Bible that's all about oppression and misogyny, chauvinism. This is the worst thing that's ever happened and now we get to celebrate it at a football stadium with a bunch of men. She writes the op-ed and there's a pastor that gets a hold of her from a reformed church in town and says, hey, can we talk? And she goes, you know, I'm writing a book on how terrible the Bible is and how terrible Christians are, especially in a modern era. They're horrible. They're, everything they're about is the ruination of society. Absolutely, I'll go to this pastor's house and do research. The pastor gets her to this house and goes, hey, okay, you're going to do this book? I mean, I don't like it, but why don't you read the Bible? Hey, shouldn't you read your primary source? You're a literature major. It's our primary source. And then she said this. I had to give it to him on this one. And I, had to, and I was starting to think about visiting his church because, there, listen, there are other churches that don't honor their primary literature. And she hated the church. So she said, at least this guy said, this is our book. You want to rip it? Read it. And guys, it kept working on her. She said she had two conversions. She went through it twice, finally visited the church who honor their primary source material. Said she found herself seeing the Psalms in worship and going, I don't believe this stuff. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just visiting. I, I, she, the word was conditioning her. Her friend said she started to change. They talked to her and said, what, what's going on? You're like talking about God and the Holy Spirit. And she goes, what if we got it all wrong? What if this isn't wrong? We're wrong. And they're like, what? Leaves her girlfriend, starts attending the church. That was what she calls her first conversion. Then she says, all right, then my purpose was this. I was going to still teach these semi-bigoted Christians that have a really cool book about how stupid they were to tell anybody that had these desires that they were wrong. So I was going to teach the church how to not. And she said she converted out of that. She goes, I started thinking just logically by about my seventh pass through the Bible. If God put the sun in space, he can affect my desires. I don't have to live this way forever. Maybe he has something greater for me than to just have regret and angst about what I did, did wrong, and left. She is a, again, <laughs> fiery. She's a firebrand, Rosaria Butterfield. Um, anyway, that's an example of God's word conditioning her. She didn't go necessarily to go to, rep not, that, not that anything's wrong with reparative therapy, nothing, but God's word just kept working on her, working on her working on her. And she kept going, well, I've got to be fair to it. I've got to submit to it to be fair to it, right? If I'm going to be fair to a text, I've got to submit to it. She had a person at Ohio State, or sorry, at her, at her college, a chaplain say, well, I've, gone, I've done away with the whole Old Testament. And she goes, you can't do that. And he's like, you don't even believe it. And she's like, but that's supposed to be your text. Isn't that wild? But the Holy Spirit works? Real quick. Simple answer is this. Jesus had the highest view of Scripture. Hands down. You guys familiar with the text? There's an argument in John 10, 35 about Jesus saying, if you don't believe me, believe the miracles. He, you know, you're calling yourself God. And he says, well, there is references to leaders that were God, right, called gods in the Old Testament. That doesn't mean we're polytheistic. But he says this very interesting phrase, the scripture, God's word cannot be broken. Cannot be broken. Look what the Psalms say. If you ever want to re read through Psalm 119, you want to get a, a view of God's word. This was Jesus' song and worship book, the Psalter. 
Your word, Lord, is eternal. It lasts forever. Theanostas. It stands firm in the heavens. It's fixed and firm in the heavens. And what do we say? Thy will be done on heaven, right? As it is in heaven, on earth as it is in heaven. Psalm 119 again. You, you are my refuge and my shield. I've put my hope in your word. That sounds strange, right? 152, long ago I learned from your statutes that you established them to last forever. Theonistos, God breathed. Last little bit as we wind it down. Matthew 22, you remember Jesus in this marriage and resurrection debate? The Sadducees, you probably heard that joke, right? They didn't believe in the afterlife necessarily, so it's, they were sad, you see. Yeah. Anyway, um, in, this, in this passage, Jesus goes back and forth with the Sadducees, and I used to think, why doesn't he just slam them? I'm thinking like Daniel 7, he just get. He actually is such a genius, he uses their platform passage against them. It says he is, the platform passage for the Sadducees is he is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? And Jesus says, yeah, not he was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They're still living. They're in heaven. They exist after their death. So have you not read, you don't know the scriptures or the power of God? Have you not read what God said to you? Think about that. Jesus is saying God can speak to you through 1,400 years down to the verb. That's Jesus' view of scripture, right? He's not the God of the dead, he's God of the living. And Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are still living in heaven. You're wrong on that because you don't know the scripture and you have not read what God said to you and this is your platform scripture. He used their, their, their party platform scripture to show they hadn't even understood that. Jesus the genius. So even though Jesus thought you could get the message from God even though 1400 years had passed, and he thought you're held accountable to what God's speaking to you through his word, right? Even down to the verb tense. That's another way of saying that is Jesus had the highest view of scripture, hands down, the highest view of scripture. And I'll just say this, why would we call ourselves Christian if we really think we're wiser than Jesus? <clears throat> Isaiah 48, grass withers, the flowers, flower fades, but the word of our God stands what? Forever. Isaiah 66, 2, my hands made all these things, thus all these things came into being. These are the ones, this is the one to whom I look to with favor. Those of a humble and contrite spirit and those who tremble at my word. Tremble at my word. If you want to expand on this and it be a part of your teaching, these are two of the best books I've ever seen on it. One is by a, a friend of mine named Michael Kruger. He's a president of uh, a seminary up in North Carolina. And then the guy I mentioned earlier, Don Carson, The Enduring Authority of Scripture. There's 36 different writers, their specialty areas, talking about how this is not a new thing, Theanostas. <laughs> this has always been the thing where Scripture has been held very, very highly from the very beginning, from the very beginning. I mean, even, even by the New Testament authors to each other. And if you want, um, there's uh, the top 10 best books on scriptural authority that I've gotten from my friend Mike Kruger. It's actually just got posted on my site today if you wanna go check it out. It's, it's, a, it's a blog post and you can actually get these. I, they're in my library, excellent, outstanding books. Let's pray together that God give us, right, a trembling at his word. Gracious God, I love you. I thank you for my brothers and sisters. I, I thank you for the worship we've heard tonight, those prayers set to music. You are great, you are mighty, you are worthy of praise. Would you help give us a, just a, a, a laser focus on being really sensitive to your word, that you would have us be people of your word, by your word, conditioned by your word. We know that this is the primary way you work in us and speak to us. I ask you to give us a love for your word that's, that's, not, that's not inordinate, but Lord, but radical in the best possible way. Give us a passion for your word because we know the flowers wither and the grass fades, but your word stands forever. We want to say with Jesus, our Savior, that your word is fixed in the heavens and will be your word forever and ever. I thank you for my brothers and sisters. I thank you for this blessing. I ask you to help redouble our commitment to the word as we go through. We ask you to just be with us as we walk through your Old Testament and see your incredible hand at work through history and how it affects and comes right to us the most great, the, the, the most incredible compliment in human history that you would care to even save us. We praise you and thank you for that right now in your name. And all God's people said, amen, amen. Amen. Yes. Hey there, family. I'm Pastor Carrie right here at First Assembly. 
Thank you so much for joining us and being a part of our service today. I just wanna encourage you on your journey with the Lord, and I wanna take some time right now and pray for you. Lord Jesus, I just thank you so much for every single person that's watching. God, I pray a blessing over them. I thank you for your presence in and through their lives. And I, God, I pray over the word that has been spoken, Lord, that it would not return void and not return empty to them. I pray a blessing upon their week and in everything that they have going on. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have any questions about today's service, please feel free and visit our website at famfm.com. We also have an app, so feel free and download that as well and visit our social media pages for more updates on what's going on here at First Assembly. Again, thank you so much for joining us. It was so great to be with you. God bless you and have a wonderful week.